going through some big questions, questions that have been brought to, to me by different people in the congregation. Today we're going to say or talk about what God has to say about sex. So let's read 1 Corinthians 6, starting at verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So God has actually a lot to say about sex. Um, just today, we're going to only be able to kind of get the, the thumbnail sketch. There's a lot that could be said, because God talks about this a lot in the Bible. And there's a lot that could be said, but we're going to kind of get the overview just today here. And in this passage here, Paul is addressing people who are definitely confused and have some different ideas about what God has to say. We'll come back to that in a minute. But everything that God has to say about sex starts at the very beginning with Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created male and female. In God's image, male and female, he created them. So, Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we are not all the same. We are created male and female. And there's a reason for this. It says God himself brought the man and the woman together. He put them together. Together and says, okay, I want you to come together. God was the first matchmaker, if you will. In Genesis 2.22, And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So God brought them together in the covenant of marriage. And um, I think that you could probably also safely say this for all uh, married couples out there too, that God joins us together. And at this point, if you're reading through Genesis, this chapter 2 here, this is where the Bible actually takes a brief moment and gives a definition of marriage. This is what marriage is. So an interjecting definition of marriage is right here. Genesis 2, 24 through 25. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So, coming together as one flesh. There's kind of a, an all-time the Bible is going through a sequence of events, so God brings her to the man, and then there's this interjected, okay, therefore, like for all time now, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will be one flesh. And so there's a definition of marriage that the Bible gives to us right at the beginning there. But this is before sin came into the world and, and things kind of fell apart. This was the good way that God had intended it. 
And God actually says to the man and the woman there, get busy. Be fruitful and multiply. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God is encouraging them to get busy there. Fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. Now, sex is not something that we talk about very often, but the Bible talks about it a lot. It comes up quite often in the Bible, and it's kind of part of the created order that God made each one of us. I mean, the very reason why each one of us are here is because of sex. It has the power to create life. It's a very powerful thing. And it's part of God's good created order. So it's important that we recognize that God created sex. This is part of the created order. He is not a prude. God is not shy about talking about it. We don't have to be shy about talking about it either. So kids, ask your parents about these things. And parents, I'm putting you on the spot here. Answer your kids' questions. Because there is a lot of media out there and lots of people who consume that media and a lot of friends who will talk to your kids the world is going to be talking to your kids about this and if you don't talk to them then they are going to get all their ideas about what sex is from everybody else so uncomfortable as it might be we need to be able to talk about this because God does and God has a lot to say about it and so Let's talk about this. I mean, the Song of Songs, for example, or the Song of Solomon, the whole book is just kind of a celebration of marital love. And just reading through that, it's pretty easy to see that God is no prude. That he made this and he made it to be good. A good thing. So, sex is good in marriage. This is the context for it. And this is a good thing that God created. In Proverbs 5, 18 and 19, it says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. It's kind of surprising, but that's in the Bible. That's from Proverbs 5 there. This is a good thing. You know, we often think about it as in terms of the bad ways that it's used, but fundamentally, sex is a good thing that God made. And so if we're going to be talking about this, we have to start how God created it originally to be good, to be a good thing within marriage. Sex is actually about intimacy. A lot of times in the Bible when it talks about the husband and wife relationship, it talks about knowing. So, Genesis 4, 1. Now Adam knew his Eve, his wife. He knew her. And it talks about Cain knowing his wife. And in 1 Samuel 1, 19, Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and she conceived. It's about intimacy, knowing one another, coming together. There's other times in the Bible where, you know, somebody sleeps with a prostitute or something like that. And usually in those times, it's described very mechanically. Like literally it says, he entered her. But in the context of marriage here, it's usually described this way. He knew his wife and she conceived. So this is what it's really about. It's about intimacy. It's a very intimate thing when a man and woman come together like that. The sexual act makes a man and woman one flesh. And our passage that we just read really brings that home. Verse 16, Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For, as it is written, the two will become one flesh. 
So he's not talking about marriage there. He's saying that if you go to a prostitute and you sleep with her, you're one body with her. You become one flesh with her. So he applies what God said at the very beginning to even sleeping with a prostitute. So the sex act makes you one flesh with somebody. This is a big, a big thing. It's, sex is very powerful. It's not something small. In the time that we are in, sex is very cheap, and it's, very, it's made to be very insignificant. But that's not how God made it, and that's not how God describes it. God describes it as being something very powerful, a very powerful bond. So we need to use this powerful thing according to the owner's manual, according to what God has said. Because something as major as this is not something to take lightly. If you're going to go hunting, you have to go through hunter safety. You have to know how to use a weapon properly. Why? Because it's dangerous. You can really hurt somebody. Sex, you need to go by the owner's manual. Why? Because you could really hurt somebody. Contrary to popular belief, there is no such thing as casual sex. That's, that's a popular belief out there, and it's a phrase that's used a lot, casual sex, but there's no real such thing. It's a powerful bond, and you can really hurt somebody if you don't use it pr properly and correctly. When it's misused, trust is broken. Lives can be ruined. Marriages are destroyed. I'll never forget reading this book about what good marriages look like. So there was, there was a couple professors who wanted to figure out, okay, what, is, what does a good marriage look like? And so they sat down with 50 different couples who had been married for a significant period of time. And um, they, they, this was in this, actually in the San Francisco Bay Area, so not exactly known for its you know, conservative values or anything like that. But they said that many of these men and women claimed that they would be tolerant of a partner's casual infidelity. And according to these couples, it was not an unforgivable sin. And they quote a lot of things about what these couples said. But then it says so much for what they said. On the rare occasions when one spouse discovered the other's infidelity, there was great suffering. It was always a serious crisis for the marriage. Despite their claims of open-mindedness and acceptance of infidelity, people who were cheated on were shocked and miserable, even if it was only a one-night stand. And their unhappiness surprised them. So we can, we can try to say or try to make sex to be something that's you know, not that big of a deal, but it really is, whether we want to think of it that way or not. It really is. In verse 13 of what we read, it says this, and you notice that there's quotes around this. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. So this is what was going on. Is this, is what, this was a saying that the Corinthian people had. Food for the stomach, stomach for food. You know, the body for sex, sex for the body. In New Testament times, sex was recreational. It was not unlike the way it is in our day and time. In the Greco-Roman culture of the New Testament, lots of people had lots of casual sex. It was common. It, uh, there's one quote up there that I just, it's amazing to me, but... This was kind of the common understanding of it. Mistresses we keep for our pleasure, concubines for our day-to-day -day physical well-being, and wives to bear us legitimate children and to serve as trustworthy guardians over our households. That was kind of the, the standard view of things. 
And so men could enjoy such pleasures as much as they liked, provided that they did not infringe on the dignity of a Roman woman married to somebody else. So as long as you weren't cheating with somebody else's wife, go nuts. That was kind of how they thought of it. There were philosophers who praised men who satisfied their sexual desires with a prostitute rather than another man's wife because that was kind of a problem, even though that was a standard. People were violating it a lot. Uh, inscriptions on uh, tombstones and for funerals show that having concubines was very common. Homosexuality was fine as long as the submissive partner was of low rank or a slave. And for that matter, if, you, if the person was a slave, there were no limits at all. Having sex with slaves was common. In fact, nobody really thought anything of it at all. And prostitution was a legitimate business, and its earnings were taxed by the state, and so nobody really thought anything of that. Sex was very casual in the Greco-Roman culture of the New Testament times. Let's look at the screen here. The seventh commandment is, you shall not commit adultery. What is God's will for us in the seventh commandment? God condemns all unchastity. We should therefore thoroughly detest it and married or single live decent and chaste lives. In other words, sex is very important. Very important to God and we need to hear what God has to say about it. So in this Greco-Roman time, Corinth was a part of this. Christianity enters into the picture here. And Christianity asserted that sexuality was sacred unto marriage. And trying to get this across to some people who had some very different ideas about this, that was kind of an uphill battle. And so sex comes up a lot in the New Testament just because of that. And here's one part from 1 Thessalonians. This is your Bible reading track for today. This is the will of God, your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body. The Greek part of that actually literally says, each one of you should control your own member. In holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because people can get hurt because of this. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This is not just prudish people trying to impose limits on fun or anything. This is what God has to say. And when you violate it, you hurt people. And God is not going to sit idly by about that. Christianity also held that virginity and singleness was an honor. People get mocked today for being virgins. But Christianity holds that being a virgin is an honor. If you're a virgin, single, that's an honor. There's nothing wrong with being single. I, have to, I find myself having to say this to people a lot. If you're single, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not weird if you're not married. Jesus was single. He was single his whole life. And so was the Apostle Paul. And as a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul said, I advise singleness. I actually hold it up and say, hey, this is a good way to go. So in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, he says, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. He actually says that. This is a good thing. Or 1 Corinthians 7, 8, 9, he goes on, to the unmarried and widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. 
for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And then 1 Corinthians 7.28, If you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. If you're single, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with marriage. It's a very good thing. But if you are single, don't beat yourself up about that. You have, an oppor- you have opportunities to serve God that married people do not. And so take advantage of that. And marriage is definitely considered in the Bible to be one man and one woman. The polygamy that goes on in the Old Testament, which some people wonder about, that was not God's design there. Because most people, or one of the main reasons for polygamy, is that you have more children. You can have a lot more children if you have a lot more wives, right? Well, and when you're worried about survival, having as many children as possible is kind of a a goal that you would have. But this is not the way God designed it. At the very beginning, when God says to Adam and Eve, fill the earth, it would be much more efficient to fill the earth if Adam had multiple wives. But God doesn't give him multiple wives. He gives him one. And so the design for marriage here, in spite of a desire to fill the earth, is one man and one woman. And it's also worth noting that when God says, I will make a helper suitable for him, when he's talking about making the woman, the word suitable, or in the ESV it says fit, is a Hebrew word that means both the same and different. In other words, they're both human beings, but there's a fundamental difference there in their, in their gender of being man and woman. It says she was called woman because she was taken out of man. So this highlights their biologically sexual difference here. And then it links that biologically sexual difference to the marriage. Therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. So marriage is connected to the sexual difference of a man and a woman. And when Jesus was asked about marriage, actually he was asked about divorce. Is it okay to divorce your wife for any and every reason? That was kind of a common thought at the time. So Matthew 19, this is on the screen here. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Okay, stop. Why is Jesus saying this? He's talking to people, Pharisees, who know the Old Testament backwards and forwards. But when he's asked about divorce, he talks about marriage. And when he talks about marriage, he has to talk about how God created them male and female. Isn't that interesting? It's like he has to start there, even though they know this already. God created them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So marriage is definitely, in the Bible, one man and one woman. And another significance about marriage is that throughout the Bible, marriage is shown to be a picture of God's love for his people. So there's another reason that marriage is sacred. God loves us. And this love that he has for his people is often compared to a husband and wife relationship. Not just once, not just a couple times, but a lot in both the Old and the New Testaments. So God loves us. He is bound together with us in 
a deep intimacy. This is an exclusive relationship that he has with us. Or, if you will, in the, uh, in the Ten Commandments it says, God is a jealous God. And that doesn't mean that God is, you know, full of jealousy. But just like, you know, any one of us, you know, marriage is a sacred thing. If somebody is going to start hitting on Deirdre, I'm going to have a problem with that. I wouldn't like that. And I'm going to step in and I'm going to get a little jealous and say, hey, no. And idolatry is equated with adultery a lot. Read the book of Hosea. It's not in your Bible reading tracks this week, but that whole book, God is constantly comparing Israel's unfaithfulness to him with idols as Gomer, Hosea's wife, cheating on him. And in the Bible, all sexuality outside a male-female marriage fell into the same category. There's actually one word that describes all these sorts of things. And it's actually the same word where we get the word pornography or the word porn. Pornia is the name of it, is the of the word here. And so when the Bible uses this word, it's used to describe anything that's outside the marriage. So just by way of illustration here, I'll put this back. That wasn't supposed to happen. Okay. So, we have marriage here. And God designs sex for marriage. And everything outside of marriage is not the way God intended it. So, marriage, sex within marriage is a good thing. It's useful. It's helpful. Okay? It's good. Outside, it's not good. And we might like to get hung up about, well, well, at least I was really close, as opposed to being way over here, but that's not how God sees it. For God, over here is just as bad as over here. In the glass is a good thing. Oops, that's too much. Maybe that's another good point. (laughs) Sex can be a god in marriage even. And you can overflow that cup. That's not good. That's not the way God intended it. So, within marriage, good thing. But whether it's close or way over here, it's all the same. And there's one word in the Bible that is used for that. And this word is described, is used for all kinds of, all kinds of uh, sexual immorality. That's usually how it's translated. So in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1, it says it, it's actually reported that there is pornea among you. Sexual immorality. And in this case, it's a man who has his father's wife. Not his mom, but his father's wife, the, the guy who, his, his stepmom, if you will. It's also used for relationship yielding children outside of marriage in John 8, 41, where the Jews say we are not born of sexual immorality. It's used for sexuality outside marriage when Jesus says anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And it's used for Sodom and Gomorrah in Jude verse 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. So this is used for everything that's outside. Verse 19 of what we read here. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And this is an important point to make. 
for Christians, our, our bodies are God's sacred temple. Our bodies are not ours to do with what we please. They are God's sacred temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. So we are not free. If you're, if you're a Christian, you're not free to do with your body whatever you want. And this has all kinds of implications, even for things like exercise and how we eat and such like that too. But for sexuality, definitely. How we use our bodies. This is God's business. We might not like that, but how we use our bodies is God's business. Who we sleep with is God's business. And God is our God in the bedroom too. It's not like you can shut that door and then God is not God anymore. What we do behind closed doors matters to God, not to mention it matters to lots of other people too. And in verse 19 here, there's something I want to point out to you. There's something subtle that doesn't really come out in the English very well. In verse 19, it says, Our bodies together make one temple. It's not like each one of us are individual temples. It's all of us as bodies together make one temple. So, in verse 19, it says, Or do you not know that your body, your being plural, there, I think I put that on the screen, your body, plural, is a temple singular of the Holy Spirit within you who you have from God. So the body, the word body is singular. Temple is singular. All of us together make one temple and form one body. Okay? Now, this is, this is where we have some, another implication. How we use our bodies is also one another's business. First Corinthians 5 11 through 13, Paul's talking to these Corinthians about, okay, some guy has a stepmom. And he says, you are proud about this. Shouldn't you be filled with grief and have dealt with this? So in 1 Corinthians 5, 11 through 13, he concludes that section by saying, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or an idolater, or a reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. And eating back then had more of a significance than it does today. Eating with somebody meant that you were in complete agreement with them. So there's, there was that significance that it had there. But then he says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside, but purge the evil person from among you. This guy in your church has his stepmom. And you're not just to let that go, you have to deal with that. Who we sleep with is actually one another's business too. In the Christian Reformed Church, church order, that actually says this, members of the church are accountable to one another in their doctrine and life and have the responsibility to encourage and admonish one another in love. The consistory, that's the elders and pastor, shall instruct and remind the members of the church of their responsibility and foster a spirit of love and openness within the fellowship so that erring members may be led to repentance and reconciliation. Because we are all together form one body how we live our lives is one another's business. And we don't like that. That's uncomfortable. But this is how it works. But we have to stress something else here. It's not like sexual sins are unforgivable or anything like that either. God forgives all sins. And we have to forgive all sins too. Because our new identity is Christ himself. We share 
in who he is. We are, if you will, we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. We are one with Christ, like it says right here. He who is joined with the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So we are bound together with Christ. This is our identity now. This is who we are. In 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, it says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So once you belong to Christ, all of this other stuff goes away. It goes away. You're not that anymore. And so we are no longer sinners. We're not sinners. But we are forgiven and sanctified to serve God instead of libido. We don't serve our libido. We serve God. Our body doesn't belong to our desires. We don't make our choices based on those things. We base our choices on what God has said. And I love the way 1 Corinthians 6 puts this here. This is just before the passage that we read. So I'm going to close with this. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. This is what you used to be. These words could have described you before. But you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You have a new identity now. And you are set apart for a new way of life. And that's what we are called to as Christians. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Lord, our God, um, it's an honor, Lord, that you would consider us so valuable that you would make us your temple. And not just a, our spirits, but even our bodies. So Lord, help us to honor our bodies and treat them with respect and to follow what you have to say about them. Lord, whether it's easy or difficult, even if the whole world does things differently, help us to be shaped and to follow what you have to say and to do what that is, even when it's difficult. So Lord, please equip us for that because there is a world out there that has some very different ideas about what sex is and what marriage is. And so Lord, help us to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.